Great. So uh, we'll jump in um, to new material, uh, new uh, uh, new module uh, for this class today. Um, module related to the role that space plays in models, representing and characterizing space, um, not merely as a static quantity influencing agents, um, but often in terms of evolving spatial situation, uh, spatial dynamics, spatial patterns. And we're going to be talking about situated agents, agents situated in space, but also mobile agents uh, moving around in space and often modifying that space and being shaped by it. One point I regretted not having touched on during our lecture on net and the lectures on networks was sort of referring back to a quote by uh, Winston Churchill, as it turns out. Um, uh, he once said in dedicated social housing uh, in the UK that uh, we build our buildings and our buildings build us subsequently. And uh, so it is with networks. And uh, one of the most salient motivations I could have given for capturing evolving networks within models is the reciprocal role that they play in our lives. Um, we build up our connections, we build up social capital. Some of them are more or less fixed and, and given through life, um, certain family connections or connections with our mother, for example. But uh, in many cases, uh, we are associated with evolving networks, uh, evolving connections. There's some matter of, 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 of choice in who we spend time with. And often that choice is uh, affiliative. It's based on our interests, our, our, our uh, desires, our habits, um, uh, our recreational interests, et cetera. And uh, once we've selected companions uh, that reflect these, they end up influencing us, influencing our attitudes, our knowledge, our perception, our beliefs, et cetera. Um, so when it comes to networks, uh, Churchill's comments about building supply as well. We build our networks and then our networks build us. And, to a degree, this is true also about spatial, our spatial context, our spatial environment. Um, uh, in some cases, it's more direct, it's more true at a larger level um, uh, for, for individuals who enjoy the um, opportunities for broader spatial mobility. Um, but often it's true in terms of our microenvironments, where we spend our time. And often that ends up shaping, of course, and reflecting our social context. So we're going to be talking about spatial environments. And going through the various project descriptions, I've been talking with, uh, with quite a few with you about, about projects or sending mail about them, continuing to work through them. But I was struck by how many of them include aspects of spatial considerations as, as a component um, of, of the, uh, the project design. Okay, so uh, today we're gonna be diving into this issue of spatial context, one of these uh, two most common aspects of, of context we capture in models. Um, I've referred to in some of my opening lectures at how compatible the perspective is of dynamic modeling on the one hand and, and the perspectives of critical realism on the other. Critical realism speaks about the importance of capturing context, mechanism, and outcome. And um, these are far from solitudes, of course. Um, often our, our context ends up affecting us uh, through mechanisms. Um, it's often in our context that outcomes are seen. And, you know, last, last, time, last few lectures, we've had talked about network context, and we'll see the same thing is true with, with spatial environments. Um, spatial environments shape us and we shape them. Um, 
We often look to them for elements of mechanism, whether it's through interventions or, or other effects, you know, the spread of an environmentally contaminated disease, think cholera, for example, or surface contamination, um, uh, or, uh, or effects spreading say, socially um, in a given area spatially um, based on what's going on in that area. But it's also often mediated by interventions, spatially mediated interventions, interventions which work in a certain area, whether it's crime related initiatives, initiatives to, to lower crime in a, in a, in a certain region, or, or whether it's uh, initiatives aimed at health promotion, for example, which may have a spatial focus to them, say core areas of an urban, urban center. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about this, and um, we're going to be going through a set of of models just to sort of situate us with some appreciation of diversity of ways in which space could be incorporated uh, in models. Um, and I'm going to do this uh, in the lecture itself. Will be pursued in two basic forms. One is talking about space from the aspects of embedding agents within space more generally, giving them a spatial context. And the second component will be talking about mobility in that context. Because uh, just as many of our models have static networks and rather than, than all going, going towards dynamic networks, many of our models situations in space, but there may not be mobility present. But in other models yet, we engage mobility. And, and those merit, each of those uh, merit some discussion and, and consideration. Okay, so let's um, open up a, a few models if we could um, to, to situate us. And I've tried to provide all of these um, via the course site. Uh, except for those that are that are built-in ones, and there's um, I should have flagged one of these as built-in the game of life, which I I, I didn't. Okay, so the first one we're going to open is one on the course site called Childhood Infectious Disease Model Use Any Logic Eight. <laughs> Again, I apologize for the impoverished nature of these uh, names. Um, so childhood infectious disease models using using any use any logic aid, okay? Um, and uh, I will go and and open up that model here as well. And maybe what I will do is drag down my any logic so we don't have to frenetically keep on going back and forth. Um, so uh, here we go. And I think I may already have it uh, open here, um, give me a moment. Uh, and looks like, looks like I don't. So I will go and get it with you. Um, so uh, here we go. And I'm going to, to grab, grab it from my, uh, uh, from my, oh, I thought, okay, I thought I'd have it right there, but I don't, so I will go download it. There we go. Okay, boom. Okay, and I'll go open it up now. Great. Okay, so um, we actually saw this model last time. Um, I double click here and you can see in this model there's sort of characterization of aging and pregnancy, fertility and birth and an infection state chart. Um, this is a, gosh, this is an older version of the model. I'd actually spent some time um, uh, modifying this for a newer version. I apologize, but um, let's go, um, let's go run it here. And we will, see people uh, set up in space. And um, 
those individuals are evolving over time, uh, characterized uh, in terms of their infection status and uh, age by the size here. Uh, we won't go into the details of this, but here you do see a network, but that network is secondary to, it's sort of implied by the spatial location. It is what we called a, a 2D network last time. So here agents are situated in space and where they're situated determines to whom they're connected. This was something we visited last time in the discussion or past few lectures and discussion of networks, but it bears note. Um, so uh, close by individuals are affiliated and interact Whereas individuals who are further away in the network may only interact directly through, through others. So this is a sort of simple way in which space might be reflected in a model. Um, it's sort of each person has a location and that location, uh, their interactions are local in terms of that spatial, spatial context. Let's close this model and let's go on to another model. We're gonna be going through these quite quickly. This one is called <clears throat> Income and Crowding-Based Communicable Disease Disparities. Version, it says version six, but I, I, I think I actually uploaded uh, a later one there this morning. And so I should, I should check. Um, income uh, version seven, yeah, so. So make sure you you download version uh, version seven here. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, there we go. And I will correct what this says. Version six. This is outdated. Um, okay. So let's let's go open up this model. And here again, we see a kind of. Um, natural history of infection and transmission. This should be familiar and loss of the immunity. But here we have a bit of a more textured situation than the last one. It's still similar in, in many broad respects. We situate agents in space and who they're nearby uh, determines with whom they, they connect. But now we have some added heterogeneity. And it's possible you'll remember this through some previous uh, coverage in this class, but uh, you'll see individuals spread out in a non-uniform way. And I'm gonna pause this, um, this model here for a minute here, and we'll delve into what's going on. Um, so you'll notice that individuals are located over space and they're, and uh, but they're not distributed uniformly. Particularly, there's a concentration of individuals in in this left left hand quarter here. Now, individuals are connected with with others if they lie within a certain distance of, of each other, within a certain distance threshold. That's the whole two D two D network um, distance based network that we talked about last time and and that we saw in the last model here. Um. But here, because people are concentrated in this area, there's a lot more crowding going on there. People are connected to many, many other people. And as we see, their crowding here is captured. Um, if, we, if we go to Maine, for example, here, and we go look at the population, what will, we will find, so I'm, I double clicked on Maine, and uh, within Maine, I sort of scrolled over here to the left of this and clicked on the population. What we will find is that people's location is determined by, in turn, their income. Here, their income. And their income is drawn from a log normal distribution with a log mean of six and a log standard deviation of two, mu and sigma for those familiar with log normal distributions. So actually their position here reflects their, on the X, Y, in terms of the X coordinate, reflects their socioeconomic status. Those that are less wealthy or to the left, and those that are more well-heeled, that are people of means, are over here to the right. And people with low, low means have, um, 
of limited means have very, very crowded conditions in the extreme and are more crowded than those over here to the right who are wealthier. And if we run this model out a little bit um, to sort of add to the texture, what we will see is that while there is infection which occurs within the, the wealthier areas, uh, most of the infection and a growing fraction of the infection is actually occurring in lower income areas. Um, that's the amount that grows uh, most, most dramatically. And over time, a larger and larger share of the infections cumulatively are occurring in these lower income areas, these crowded areas. Um, and you could, you could see it in terms of the prevalence rates and the lower income, the fractional prevalence, the fraction of people that are infected at any one time is a lot higher than the, the higher income. Um, and it's higher than the overall population prevalence of infection. So here we have a model where space, people's spatial location is tied up with their income. And uh, that induces crowding-based disparities, which in turn lead to a larger burden of infection in, in areas which are lower income and, and more crowded. Um, yes, question. Uh, yes, Maurice. Okay, uh, do you want to read it out? Uh, so, sorry, Nate. I, I think it was a question about um, uh, the earlier model, and uh, we, we've gone okay. well past that. Now. I forgot to lower my hand, but it was just to ask the significance of, this, of the size of the agents. Oh, there it was uh, dictated by age. So people were um, of of a so the people were denoted using a using circles, and those circles the radius of those circles was dictated directly proportional with a, with an offset term to their age. Okay. And therefore the circles tended to grow over time as they age. Hopefully that's helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. yep. Here people are all of uniform, uniform size, but their X location is dictated by their, by their, um, their income. Um, so here income tied in with, with spatial location and that induces crowding and that leads to vulnerability to infection and higher infection burden. Um, a little bit more complicated relationship between space and dynamics here, space and, and characteristics uh, than the last one. Um, in both cases, people's location was a characteristic of a person, um, but in the first one, it had more limited impact. Um, it was less tied in with other characteristics. Here, it had it had more impact, and it shaped their subsequent trajectory in pretty profound ways. Um, let's go to a model we saw in perhaps the opening day or two of class: uh, GIS food environment version six with added added adding supermarkets. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, so we'll go back here, and this was way, whoa, this was way up at the top. It was the third model uh, that was uh, shared by me there, okay? Um, and uh, I will go download that, and I want to open it up. So here we have... Another type of relationship uh, illustrated between space and uh, a person's health trajectory. Um, and uh, they have a different relationship with the environment, um, different types of, in, of, of needs from the environment. So if we remind ourselves on this model, this is a model situated geographically in, in Melbourne, Australia, as it turned out, where I built it one time with a, with a boot camp. And uh, we see people situated in space. Um, so people are these little weebles. Um, maybe, maybe people here are too, too young for weebles, but uh, I suspect Maurice and Wade and I probably remember them. Um, uh, so, so there's a little weeble character there. Um, 
whose size, whose girth is proportional to their weight, I might add. Um, and uh, we have uh, them situated in a geographic space, which is also characterized by basically three sets of resources. Parks shown in these, um, these green squares here, uh, which are situated at their, their actual locations uh, geographically. Uh, supermarkets situated at their locations in a database initially, and then convenience stores uh, shown here uh, with these small green sort of storefronts. Um, so uh, we have people being placed in this geographic space. And if you go look at the characteristics of a person, you may remember this model, their weight is evolving over time, proportional, it reflecting their sort of basal energy expenditure as well as physical activity energy expenditure. And physical activity ener energy expenditure is, is um, shaped by their proximity to parks, the distance from a park, with the idea being, sort of mental model being that we are capturing how they evolve based on how distant they are from parks. And, uh, excuse me, they evolve according to their physical activity amongst other factors. And that, that uh, if they live closer to a park that allows for more physical activity, it will tend to be higher. Beyond that, they engage in food seeking behavior and that food seeking behavior can bring them either to a supermarket or a convenience store. And there's more detail here we won't go into about their, the, the particular choice of what they eat over time um, based on what's in their larder. Um, but the idea is they could dash to a convenience store and grab a, um, you know, grab a burrito or, or grab a, a Twinkie or something or a, in, in Australia, meat pie or a floaty. And uh, here over um, uh, in the supermarket, they can get healthier fare. Now their choice of whether to go to each of these is based on some characteristics um, uh, and particularly not only on their preference for convenience store meals relative to supermarket meals, but also their location and how far the nearest supermarket is located from them. Um, so there's this probability of going for convenience food and, and basically it figures out the distance of the supermarket and convenience store and figures out the probability uh, based on that distance plus their own preferences that they will go to one versus the other. Um, so their choices as a situated agent in this space, in this geographic space, depend on the nature of their space, depend on the, the food environment in this case, what's located close to them. They may have a preference for healthier foods, but if they're located just across from a convenience store where they have to go, you know, kilometers and kilometers to a supermarket, they might make the proverbial milk and bread run or Twinkie run to the convenience store. Um, and end up uh, the worst for it. So um, this was the idea, and it was partly shaped like this to, to allow us to investigate interventions that would change the food or physical activity environment. So running this model, I'm gonna run the baseline here. Um, again, our, our goal is to, to, to move quickly and live light on the land here with respect to these example models. They're so just to situate us in this topic. So we're, we're going to have people, here's a little weeble here. There's some others um, located uh, at various points with homes. And it turns out that they are moving along these thoroughfares, along these various streets um, as they are, 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 in this case, driving, um, probably uh, unrealistically much given Melbourne, um, to, uh, to these various resources. And so they make their way back and forth to these resources with a certain speed according to their choices for whether they're going for a convenience store food, as you can see this one for which it has a uh, unfavorable predilection uh, or whether they go to grocery store food, some of these um, locations. And by uh, going and clicking on some, um, uh, on the map, we could potentially allow this individual who seems the worst for their 
uh, for their convenience store runs to have healthier options. And they may partake of fresh fruits and vegetables more quickly if their home is surrounded by, by grocery stores. And that may uh, aid their evolution in a healthier direction. Um, uh, by the same token, we could potentially scatter uh, parks around um, and uh, allow them to, to make less, um, uh, less frequent uh, or allow them to engage in more active physical activity. So um, this was a model agents were situated in space, the characteristics of that space, not so much proximity to other agents, but characteristics of the space, location of parks, location of supermarkets, convenience stores, shaped their choices and health evolution over time. Um, a different relationship of the agents with the spatial environment. And one here, which if we have spatial dynamics, such as the ability to add parks, the ability to add supermarkets, we may end up affecting the health evolution of those agents in favorable ways. And indeed, this one is, is slimming down um, compared to their sort of nadir uh, earlier, where they were uh, making heavy use of this convenience store. Okay, um, so that was uh, another, uh, another model. Um, all of those are in a continuous spatial environment. In the last case, a GIS environment, a geographic information system environment, um, or something that can draw on the vast uh, amounts of information present um, uh, in geographically tagged fashions. Um, but the first two also in a spatial environment, even though it wasn't strictly geographic, it was sort of more abstract. Let's go open up two more models that involve situated agents. I, I should note, you may ask, well, this one with adding supermarkets, they were kind of bopping back and forth to supermarkets or convenience stores. Um, doesn't that involve mobility? And, and the answer is yes. Um, the mobility there was, um, uh, was to sort of allow them to undertake a transactional task that affected them you know, which convenience, which store they went to, which proprietorship. Um, it, it didn't really strictly govern the, um, the subsequent dynamics that they went to the store compared to that they made that food choice. So I'm kind of playing that down as an aspect of mobility. Visually, it was, you know, it's kind of interesting, kind of, kind of, uh, 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 you know, confirming to see that to understand model operation is is proceeding correctly, but it wasn't deeply um, a part of subsequent dynamics. It wasn't that they went to the grocery store and thereby met other people with a commitment to health and formed walking groups, which you know brought them on a further trajectory. It's more sort of a little bit not quite epiphenomenal, but it had more shallow impact on. Um, that they actually physically went to the grocery store compared to just making use of the food. Um, let's go open gridded hybrid model. Um, so this model came, was a little example model I put together based on a student's interest some years back on fish farms and sea lice. Um, so it's a different sort of model. So we're gonna go to gridded hybrid. And, and as its name suggests, just like this past model we've been using, the one with the food environment, this is a, a hybrid model. And, and what we will see is that it's composed of patches and each patch has in it a set of sea lice. And the sea lice are either immature or mature. This is actually much more abstract than sea lice, but I was inspired by the discussion of sea lice to kind of characterize at an aggregate level, the um, production of of, of some uh, organism um, at a point that we treat in an aggregated fashion in this compartmental or system dynamics model. It's immature, immature and once it reaches uh, maturity, it can reproduce and lead to more births of sea lice. Um, and sea lice importantly can migrate um, both, both directions in and out. And that's what this vertical sort of uh, 
flow is. Um, and there's some effects of kind of sea lice density on their ability to reproduce. Um, uh, this this is all well explored in, in um, ecological literature, carrying capacities and, and density related impacts on birth rates, for example. But we have an effective birth rate and, and maturation that's affected by, by sort of the density of these. So if there's tons of sea lice, there's a lower birth rate than if there were they're comparatively few and lots of, of, of resources in the area. So we have sea lice maturing, and in a more complete model, we might have salmon, and the salmon are being bitten by and having their vitality sapped by the sea lice um, in a way that might affect the evolution of the, the salmon farm or what have you. Um, uh, okay, so um, the key point is that each patch has this, and in Maine, we are going to have a population not of sea lice or not of salmon in this case, but patches. And we have some number of patch columns and patch rows. And we are going to knit those columns and rows together into a lattice. Uh, we're going to tessellate space, cover space with this in a grid. And each grid cell um, has one of these patches. And there's migration to neighboring grid cells. And uh, here, uh, if we speed it up, you'll see the coloring, which denotes the population of sea lice, the size of the population of sea lice in the cell. You'll see it evolving over time as sea lice migrate, for example, from one from one zone to another zone. And there's a more complex model involving West Nile virus, which you'll also find in your um, in your example models that I've provided to you. Um, so here we have these patches situated in space, communicating locally, which is often a hallmark of, of spatial interaction with other, other patches in this case. And each pass has some dynamics within it. That's a different model yet of the effect of space. Space is kind of limiting spatial interaction there between patches, okay? Um, so uh, one more model to go on the spatial embedding side. And this one's built into any logic. So I'd like to, to open it together. You go up to help and go to example models under help. Help example models. And down here under T uh, on the example models area, you will find the game of life, hence the T. Okay, it's way down at the the bottom of the example models, okay? So what did I do? I went, yes, okay, discard it, fine. Uh, I went to help example models and I scrolled down on the right-hand side, look at all the examples and found the game of life, okay? Now, okay, so the game of life. I started working with this game of life, I think in 1984, and I've never quite kicked my habit. Um, of uh, coming back to it. It's an intriguing model. It's an extraordinarily stylized model. Um, here we have individuals um, that are that are basically depicted in cells. And, and each cell here, each of these patches, we'll call it for consistent um, characterization. Um, uh, maybe I'll zoom in a bit so those in the room can see it a little bit, the patch, the patches, the grid here a little bit more clearly. Each of these patches um, can be one of two states. Either it can be live or empty or dead, it's often called. Um, and uh, it as a dynamical system, um, and as an age-based model, it's evolution over the next little bit, whether a patch is colonized if it's currently empty or if it's currently live, whether it continues live or dies, depends on its current state and, and the state of the model. And so if it's empty, it will be colonized if it has exactly three, count them, neighbors. Three neighbors, it'll be colonized. Three neighbors right around it and the eight cells around it. So if you imagine 
you know, you have one of these and say this cell, um, it would depend on these eight ones round at three at the top, three at the bottom, and these two on either side. So those in the cardinal directions in northeast, southeast, southwest, and northwest. Okay. Um, so that's an empty cell. An empty cell will be colonized if it has exactly three neighbors. It'll be colonized by one of those three is the idea. By contrast, if a cell is live right now, it will only survive if it has the right number of neighbors. If it has fewer than two neighbors, it will die off. If it has four more neighbors, it'll be too crowded and it will die as well. Um, so it needs kind of the right balance of, of neighbors. And um, I think I introduced this to you before, but this is a model in discrete time. And I used it to, to motivate that. Here, our, our attention is more in the spatial aspect. And this is what is called a cellular automaton. Um, each cell depends on its neighbors in space. And John von Neumann, who I think I mentioned before, made seminal contributions across many areas of science, computer science, physics, economics, uh, is, is um, someone, who, an early pioneer in these cellular automata models. And amongst other things, he was using those models of computation. But here we have um, an initial state and it's evolving over time and everything evolves in lockstep. Um, our interest here lies in the spatial characteristics. And you'll notice, for example, while this gives the appearance of moving, each cell, it, no, no one cell moves. Um, this this so-called blinker stoplight, um, uh, there's no cell moving here. The cell either survives, for example, this middle one on which my mouse is put, um, uh, that one has survived all this time. It's continued to survive because it has two neighbors at any one time. At any step, it has two neighbors. Sometimes those neighbors are north and south. Sometimes they're east and west. But it, it always has two neighbors, so it survives. By contrast, the ones um, that are on either side of it, and I'll pause it to show, for example, this one, this one's going to die off in the next time step because it only has one neighbor. It's too lonely. It doesn't have enough support by neighbors, and so it tends to die. Same as the one in the bottom. But this one here, what will happen to it the next time step? It will be what? Can anyone say? What will happen to this in the next time step? It will be, well, this one is lot as as dead as this empty already. This this maybe you can't see it, but it's this, it's this um, yellow one here. Um, on which my oh sorry my pointer my subyao is is pointed. What's um wh what's going to happen with that one the next time step? It's empty right now. It will be filled. Filled, yeah. It'll be colonized because it has one, two, three. Count them, neighbors, right? Um, one to its northwest, one to its west, one to its southwest, right? Um, so if we're considering this one, it will be born. This one will also be born because it has a neighbor to its northeast, its east, and its southeast. Uh, but these two will die. And then so, lo and behold, it will blink. Boom, boom, boom. And the same thing is true the other way, right? Um, this is the game of life. Totally deterministic. There's no randomness here. But moreover, there is a appearance of movement. I mean, you can actually see um, uh, sort of higher level structures called, for example, uh, spaceships or starcraft, et cetera, moving around sometimes. Um, but there's no, there's no cell that actually moves. There's no agents that move. Um, they're simply, these patterns are simply leading, are kind of distributed quantities in which some cells live live and die. And if I were to start that again, you might be able to see some of those um, those uh, spacecraft or or what what have you. Um, 
this, but this also has the appearance of moving, but it's actually not really moving. Um, yeah, so here's a glider. This is called a glider. It looks like a thing moving along in some way, but it's actually um, just something that, you know, is, is, is um, uh, living and dying in a way that it gives the appearance of, of mobility. Um, so this is the game of life. Um, here you have strictly localized interactions in this space. And they give rise to fascinating patterns. And again, people have spent countless hours, you know, building up computers in this and otherwise interacting with it and and programming <laughs> programming things in it and discovering uh, invariants, et cetera. The game of life. This is a discrete spatial embedding. Discrete because it's broken up into these squares, and each square has exactly zero or one agent in it. It's either live or dead. Right? You could think of the squares as themselves agents, and often that's the the view we take. You know, is this patch currently empty or is it living? Um, or you could say, is it dead or is it living? And the dead ones can come back to life, Lazarus like. Okay, um, so um, spatial embedding. Um, uh, I'd like to now look at some models that are also situated in space, but involve spatial mobility, okay? Um, we saw one last time, so I'm, I'm not really gonna spend much time on it, should be very familiar. It was the hierarchical infection transmission model. And just to remind you of that, or anyone viewing this video who didn't watch my previous video yet, um, uh, you know, I'll just remind you, we had cities, the cities internally had networks. Whoa, oh, well, look at that, look at that. Okay, um, uh, bum, 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 bum. Um, well, that is interesting that that- You still have another model running in the background. Oh, do I? Spot button isn't data. Okay, um, but I've I've seen that at times where there doesn't seem to be a model in the background. Uh, it is it is possible because my computer is pretty uh, pretty busy here. So we have cities. Each city has uh, is associated with a set of networks. Um, wow, yeah, there is there is something going on here uh in the background that's true um and uh okay um so wait um and uh, these cities are themselves linked in networks and these networks um uh, that link to cities serve as the basis for people to move from city to city um and by moving from city to city and a person could um can be transported with all their state, including their infection status. And this can allow an individual, for example, who was infected in one city to migrate to another city in a way that brings the infection with them. So that was just a reminder. We saw this model in our, our previous lecture on dynamic networks, and I won't go, um, won't go into it more here. So the next model that I'd like you to load it's something called the environmental contamination hybrid. This one is located on the course site here. Um, so if you scroll down, um, uh, you from the top of it, uh, it's called environmental contamination hybrid. It's down towards the bottom of the example models. And I'd invite you to, uh, to open that, okay? Um, and meanwhile, I will go and, um, uh-oh, okay, cool, okay. Okay, now interestingly, some of those, were, these are still open, close all, no, okay. Okay, um, great. So I'm going to open up environmental contamination hybrid myself, and we're good to go. Wandering elephants had a, it threw a fit. I guess it was rampaging on my computer too. Okay, 
Um, so environmental contamination hybrid has um, uh, a model which is spatially situated. So it's in an abstract space. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a set of homes, there's a set of workplaces and a population. And the population um, uh, can become ill uh, and can recover. Um, but what's notable is that this illness is not spread from person to person. It's spread via the environment, okay? And specifically, a person who is uh, ill in the environment sheds into the environment. By mean, I mean that by that I mean they put pathogen in the environment that can contaminate other people, other agents, um, and which environment they're in determines where that pathogen goes. If they're at work, it goes into their workplace environment. If they're at home, it goes into their home environment. And indeed, home has a pathogen reservoir that builds up and decays, as does their workplace here. Okay. Uh, according to a mean pathogen lifetime. So um, we're going to run this model with a, a small population here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to the final experiment here. And and it is small indeed. We have uh, people located in a home. You can see this indicates the amount of contamination and they contaminate the workplace. And then some people at the workplace might live in another home and they can bring it back to that home. Um, we could run it with a, um, uh, a medium small population um, and we'll see many more homes, only one of which starts uh, infected and you can't even, it's hard to even see which one it is. And then over time, people will be switching home workplace, home workplace, home workplace, and uh, building up if they're infected. So here's a home. It has some infection. It's spread to others in the home via that reservoir. And by virtue of doing that, when they go to the workplace, for example, they can bring it to the workplace, and then it will disseminate to homes. Notice now it's disseminated to many homes. And uh, as a result, it's spreading within those homes. And uh, once an individual has caught it from home, they can bring it to other workplaces, et cetera. Maurice raised his hand. Yes, Maurice. Yeah, I was just uh, trying to think of an example. And uh, the only one I could think of was like athlete's foot. Uh, athlete's foot might be a good example. I mean, um, no norovirus. Um, is another one uh, that that is very very uh, uh, very very transmissible. It involves fecal oral transmission and even small contamination, like when a person's preparing meals um, or or handling food um, within a family, can lead to contamination of family members, and, and it can be picked up uh, from surfaces. Um, influenza can spread on surfaces, and you know, COVID nineteen has some ability to spread on surfaces, although its primary pathway is uh, is aerosol. Um, so those are you know some examples. Um, in um, in less sanitary conditions, if this were you know an area uh, in a developing country without proper sanitation, cholera might be another possible example, though normally that's spread in, you know, water bodies that are contaminated and often when, you know, basic sanitation like sewers and so on break down. Um, but um, you can have, you know, some pathogens build up in, in particular facilities, for example. Okay, um, so here what we're seeing is people moving back and forth between facilities, um, contaminating those facilities, picking up infection from the from the uh, facilities, et cetera. The, the communicable mobility has, um, excuse me, multi-clinic SIS hybrid is similar things where people go to clinics near them to get treated and, um, and their location dictates which clinic they go to and therefore the wait times to which they're subject, et cetera. Um, because the infection spreads locally, um, it, it will lead to many people from the same area often seeking care at the same time, at the same location, the same nearby clinic, 
which can overwhelm the clinic in ways that might not happen if they sought care equally at all clinics. Um, uh, this communicable mobility we saw last time, these wandering sort of balloons that could pop each other or individuals moving around in random ways. And the final model that I'll, I'll show is another built-in model in any logic. It's the shelling segregation model. So I'm going to go to, to example models and we'll go down to shelling segregation here and open that up. Um, so the shelling segregation model was created by economist Thomas Schelling, um, thinking about patterns of segregation. He actually created it using a checkers board at the time. This was the 1970s because he didn't have a, a ready way whoa, um, to, to run it, uh, run it in, a, in an automated fashion. But here uh, we again have space divided into patches. In that sense, it should be reminiscent of uh, the cellular automaton model we saw, Game of Life. Um, here, patches can either be empty, that's the sort of tan ones here, or cocky color, or they can be occupied by people of two different colors, red or black. And uh, the idea here is that a given person um, has a preference uh, for where they are. Unlike the game of life, you have mobility here. So if a person is, is living in an area that um, has other people um, uh, that look like them in too few numbers, they have a certain probability of moving and they may move to a spot, uh, to another spot. And it will lead to them to tend to move around until they're in areas where they have um, uh, they're surrounded by other people like enough them, they're not inclined to move. And what this leads to, what this induces is even with modest levels of preference um, for people to look like them in their neighborhood, such as moving fewer than 50% of people look like them, it can lead to these broad patterns that are very reminiscent of segregation, very reminiscent of, of sort of the, the blocks of of um, people of similar backgrounds that, that live in and clustered in, in certain areas. And uh, this is an extremely simple model involving only the simplest assumptions about preferences and mobility, and yet it can induce these high-level patterns, these emergent patterns. So here, um, people's movement is shaped by the environment, but not in a fixed way, not in a way that reflects, you know, fixed resources like parks that are affecting them, but in a way that reflects the other patterns that are formed in the environment. Um, they, uh, they will move if, if, if their local environment formed by other agents is such that it doesn't meet their cherished prejudices and move to other areas that, that, um, uh, that are selected randomly, but where the, if they settle down, it may mean that those prejudices are, are um, fulfilled um, and or are, are, are maintained, that they're, they're living near people preferentially that look like them. And, and this does lead to these very troubling larger scale patterns of disparity of, of people with, with um, who are not mixing, you know, it's mixing a lot of like with like, and very, very little mixing of people of different groups, which is really troubling societally. Um, but in this case, the mobility is affected by the environment, but by emergent properties in the environment themselves affected by agent action, not by fixed things like parks. Um, it's almost as if that model of the food environment had stores moving into areas where there's greater demand and agents with healthier preferences moving near those stores and, and you start to get this co-evolution of the environment on the one hand with agents um, uh, with this minimalist model of mobility. Um, in that sense, you, this co-evolution of environment and agent is a little bit reminiscent of the wandering elephants. So ladies and gentlemen, here we have a set of different um, models, uh, each characterizing some aspect of the environment, spatial environment, and some aspect of individual evolution. Um, let's talk about 
some motivations for why you would do that. After all, um, these types of agent-based models are extraordinarily flexible. What would motivate one to capture these patterns associated with space, with or without mobility within, within a model? Well, one factor is locality of perception. We saw that in the very latest model, a shelling segregation model. You know, person perceives those around them and, and chooses to move or not accordingly. But we also saw in, in many of these models uh, some sort of locality of influence or transmission. Um, whether it was the fact that I go to a store that's nearby or whether it was that very first model we opened where people transmitted to nearby people to them in space. Um, uh, the crowding we saw in that income disparity model. Um, uh, you know, capturing those patterns of locality can really lead to change dynamics. For example, slow spread of waves over the landscape, as we see with rabies, for example, with um, skunks in the northeastern U.S., uh, the Connecticut area, for example. Um, another thing we, another motivation for having this is to represent things like social determinants of health, representing differential access by agents, by persons, let's say, to, to spatially limited resources. For example, the presence of food deserts in certain areas where a person finds it harder to find, would have to go much further to find healthier foods, or a certain underserved areas, which are which are not well served by healthcare, for example, where many individuals might have to crowd into a given clinic to to deal with a, a local outbreak of, you know, RSV uh, or FIFT or some other childhood uh, disease, um, and uh, and this can lead to you know very differential health effects. These the fact that. There are more parks near certain individuals or more grocery stores near others, for example. Um, uh, another, another factor would be uh, if you're interested in spatial behavioral outcomes. For example, maybe your model is interested in if we put more walking uh, paths in place, you know, realistically speaking, how much will that help lower obesity in this community we're working with? Um, we worked with researchers in New Mexico um, in some brainstorming about agent based modeling in exactly that area some years back, the University of New Mexico. Um, in other cases, you're interested in spatial phenomena, for example, spatial concentration of, of characteristics in certain areas. So maybe you're, you're interested in under vaccination rates um, within your province, reflecting on the fact that that often there's community clustering of vaccination attitude. So um, you might say, well, you know, if we have 80% vaccination, what's the problem? One out of every five people out there is unvaccinated. What's the big deal? We, we meet all the criteria for the critical vaccination threshold, sometimes called Q, that that means, you know, an infection of basic reproductive number less than five won't spread. But the truth of the matter is that often unvaccinated people will tend to live together. And so in a given region, you might have, when I say live together, I don't mean strictly, um, you know, all crowd in an area, but in a given area, you might have 50% vaccination coverage for some areas of the province and 95% for others. And the spatial concentration may allow outbreaks for pertussis or for measles or for COVID-19 that otherwise wouldn't seem possible. These vaccine, um, these diseases that can be mitigated by vaccines. Um, you also might be interested in sort of spatial reference, but why you see certain oscillations in certain areas or large spikes in, in numbers over time of people seeking care. Um, uh, and maybe you want to, you know, match those against empirical observations. Um, in yet other cases, what you're seeking to do is to understand intervention impacts across space. So if you intervene, you know, how does, how does that help 
uh, core areas of a city compared to rural areas to make sure we we equitably um, address the needs of the whole population. Um, there are times where having a, a, a spatial, uh, particularly geographic depiction can help enhance plausibility with stakeholders. It leads them to recognize the relevance of a model that otherwise might be seen as too abstract. Um, and finally, um, there are times where representing spatial environment, particularly spatial mobility, may be important for capturing network change. So we talked about these disparities and, and wanting to describe sort of spatial disparities and the occurrence of infection, for example. We saw this model earlier, or you know, to explain patterns that we see, like, like these aren't from rabies, but you see sort of similar waves to a degree within rabies um, epizoonotics, some spread in the, in the um, uh, mammal population. Um, another motivation, is to, to represent interventions that are themselves spatially mediated. Um, so maybe, you know, you're talking about situating a grocery store in food deserts. I mean, your model needs some representation of space to understand the effect of that, that you're putting it in an area that was underserved, that had few grocery stores. And the very words we use to describe that and putting it in an area that was underserved is give nod to the fact that, you know, we're, we need a, we need a model that has space to plausibly investigate this. Or maybe you're seek, seeking to locate a community health clinic or walk in mental health clinics in certain areas of, of burdened by high mental health um, uh, concerns. Um, there are times where interventions are themselves mobile. So you want to simulate door-to-door -door screening or patrolling and community safety and well-being, for example. Um, cases where maybe policing partners are interested in patrolling strategies, as Edmonton Police Service uh, is interested with agent-based modeling, for example. Um, or maybe you're interested in, in, in capturing aspects of, uh, of uh, spatial mobility restrictions, maybe isolation and quarantine at a household or, or in the neighborhood um, or at municipal levels. And, uh, and that will change the spread of infection by, by, by reducing the mobility. Um, yeah. Yeah, food delivery services. Yeah, availability. So that's, that, that is quite interesting, right? Um, uh, so those are spatial, spatial phenomena. You know, they're they're available based on a certain region, for example. Um, and maybe making those available um, could aid, uh, you know, in, in in sort of healthier eating and and in some cases, particularly for elderly, et cetera. Okay. Um, so let's talk about um, about something which you may have wondered about in my in my comments on this. You may notice that my comments on these motivations, both these ones for about interventions and these ones for embedding, have some similarity to my motivations for representing networks in population. And indeed, space and networks, you know, they often have, they often play some similar roles in models. They're different in some ways but there's a lot of parallels between them. And they both capture aspects of context, right? Um, the factors that motivate one often motivate the other. Um, uh, and, you know, sometimes one of them takes center stage. Um, often we have models which only include one, space, or alternatively networks. Sometimes we have models with both. Often one of these is kind of more natural given your research question or what interventions you're trying to represent. Maybe you're trying to represent interventions that are spatial in character. Maybe rep a spatial representation is more natural and you just connect people who are located nearby in space um, at any one time. Um, there may be other times where you're seeking to intervene on a network with things like contact tracing or, or factors that involve 
explicit building of networks, such as what Ellen Scheele and Penny Hogg pursued in Canada and then us in Australia. Um, but uh, in any case, there may be characteristics of these that make them crisper and kind of easier to characterize the effects you're interested in. Um, and often, you know, one of them will be somewhat lighter weight. It'll be, it'll be a sort of more um, parsimonious to describe. Uh, sometimes spatial movement can drive network dynamics. This is quite common, right? Um, who we're near, who's in our immediate contact network might be secondary to, might result from where we're located, from our spatial moment, movement. So here in the classroom, um, there may be people co-located with me. And if I go back to a meeting in my office, it's the people at those, at that, uh, in that office that are, that are in my contact network. If I go into the lab, it's people in the lab that are in my contact network. Um, but there are times where, you know, network connections, uh, a relationship, for example, might drive your spatial movement, maybe lead you to travel between cities um, uh, or collegial connections. So some models do include space and networks. Um, and often, you know, one of the things you want to sort out is do we, do we need space in our network, uh, in our model? Can we use networks instead? Um, do we need networks um, more fundamentally and we can leave out space? These are things you wanna, you wanna think about. Um, so when we have spatial models, there's a number of patterns they fit into. There are models that use geographic information. We saw that with the Melbourne example, right? With location of parks and grocery stores and convenience stores. Um, we saw it, you saw it in kind of a pseudo way with wandering elephants. Um, we saw, I saw something different um, for that. Um, often we can use geographic information uh, to great effect. We can determine distances of a person from, from certain resources that might shape their behavior. For example, health service seeking, that was, captured in, in some of those models uh, to which I referred, even if I didn't show them, or the availability of, of, of fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, the geographic information could constrain movements. You know, the fact that maybe geographically it's not too far from A to B, but it's circuitous because you have to go across a bridge, which is located elsewhere, or, or, or make a, a, a road that, that involves detours because of the geography. Um, uh, you can use these to route agents along particular paths that represent thoroughfares, you know, uh, subway, or metro stops, et cetera, that reflect the, the, the reality of the public transit network or the, the major highways. Um, you can associate agents with resources uh, that are in the environment um, in, in point of fact, acute care centers or parks or or what have you, um, create information on background risk of exposure, say to pollution, you know, uh, P, uh, PM 2.5 for, for particular um, exposures and capture features and, and move. Um, often we have simulation augmenting GIS data or, or augmenting the environment uh, within a given area. Um, maybe reflecting pollution or contamination or what have you. Um, you could have trucks, for example, construction trucks. This was a PhD thesis of Darian Brown here at the U of S some years back. Um, construction trucks damaging roadways over which they travel. And, and by virtue of that, those roads become less readily, tra less ro readily traveled by other you know, future uh, type of um, uh, commerce. Uh, uh, and finally, agents can be affected by mobility patterns that are observed, you know, in, in some sort of GIS context. So there's just a couple of types of major ways in which we capture spatial embedding kind of at a mechanical level within our models. One we saw, which is continuous embedding, uh, the wandering elephants uh, were examples of that, but in fact, most of the models we looked at were in continuous space. 
but there was a class of them, the game of life, uh, shelling segregation model, which were in discrete cells. Now, often um, uh, you have some follow on differences from these. At the least, discrete cells are commonly leave the space to be tessellated. And the most common form is you have a square grid, columns, and rows. I'm rather partial to a grid form, which uh, uh, I first used when I was doing my first serious research based agent based modeling in 1990, um, which involved hexagonal. Um, landscapes. And it turns out hexagons allow um, additional uh, additional sort of flexibility in capturing um, more degrees of, of, move, of movement. They're sort of a regular polygon into which you can divide the entire space with that uniform polygon with the most sides. Um, you can do it in four, but you can do it in six, and that has extra directions associated with it extra sort of neighbors associated with it. So those are discrete cells. Sometimes in an any logic, um, there's this rule that only one agent can be in a cell at a time, uh, agent of a given sort. Um, by contrast, continuous embedding, um, traditionally they're just located at a space, at a point in continuous space. They're, um, they're small compared to the landscape, and we don't treat them as excluding each other if they're too close by, unless you you really want to force that on the model, in which case you can. You could rule out agents being closer than a certain level. But there's nothing built in, for example, to any logic to say you cannot have agents more than a certain distance from each other. And you know, here, um, when thinking about representing space, representing networks, you know, you should be thinking about, okay, to what degree are the spatial structures exogenous? Do they get imposed on the model and affect the model, but they're not affected by the model? They're not generated by the model. An example would be that GIS environment for food, uh, you know, where we had parks, supermarkets and grocery stores, those weren't being generated by the model, but they were affecting the model. Their locations were exogenously imposed on the model, right? It wasn't generating, by contrast, wandering elephants or environmental contamination, um, uh, athlete's foot. Um, you know, here we might have endogenous production of the dynamics over the landscape because of this. Um, and indeed, um, you can get this um, in spades with agent-based models. This, uh, you may recall, is a model of prion-based contamination coming from deer in a landscape. Um, so the deer, the infected deer, the deer can become infected by eating in areas or drinking in areas contaminated by prions, these misfolded proteins that are, are terribly persistent in environment, seem that they can live for a decade or more. Um, but once infected, uh, they'll go through a set of stages and in later stages, they'll shed them and back into the environment and they can contaminate it more. And what this leads to what, what this induces is patterns of prion contamination that reflect deer behavior. The fact that deer go to the water to drink leads to contamination of certain regions near water, or they go to favored landscapes for, for food consumption, grain piles. And so the deer may deposit prions there um, in ways that endanger other deer more than you would think from the just average levels of prions in the environment. Um, so, you know, agent mobility um, plays a big role in shaping patterns. Um, mobility, uh, when you represent it beyond just spatial phenomena, when beyond spatial embedding, when you represent mobility, often what you see is it accelerating spatial effects. So instead of 
infections are spreading locally, you know, within a continent, now you have people flying between continents and bringing COVID-19 from one country to another, from overseas to a country. And it can allow for much quicker dissemination, people hopping from one city to another across the continent and bringing the infection over or bringing ideas or, or beliefs or conspiracy theories or what have you. Um, and this can let really lessen the restriction of localized spread. You know, often localized spread slows down the spread uh, within a given landscape um, because it's local. You infect neighbors, right, in space. Um, but when you have mobility, it can accelerate it. Um, a colleague of mine once commented in a talk I heard, I think it was Scott Page, he commented how, if you really think about it, um, airplanes are just amazingly um, frightful instruments for bringing infection from one area to the other. He said it's like a it's like an intercontinental syringe that you know packs a bunch of people up, some of whom are infected from one continent, flies them to another continent in a sealed fashion, you know, a sealed and hermetically sealed fashion, and puts them. Well, it's not hermetically, but uh, puts them in a new in a new city and lets them free, and they they roam and start to spread. Right? It's it's like it's like a intercontinental. Um, you know, subcutaneous injection into the population. And um, while it has its limits as an analogy, the point is mobility can lead to profound differences. And, you know, it can lead to, to influence to propagate from one place to another in ways that it otherwise would not or would take a very long time. You know, um, think transatlantic, you know, cruises uh, spreading infection versus you know, a, um, a London to New York flight or what have you. Um, uh, and intentional mobility is especially interesting here because, um, you know, often um, when people think about, say, spread of an infectious disease um, within a given area, um, there's naive thinking about, well, it's a very sparsely populated area, so that would probably mean it will it'll spread a lot more slowly. And there is some impact of that. Um, uh, certainly crowding makes a big difference in spread, but you know, even in rural areas, people come together. They come together for social activities. They come together for school. They come together for workplaces. They come together for church or what have you. Um, and, and here it can lead to you know, spread, opportunities for spread beyond, beyond which, you know, or at levels you might not anticipate given the simple population density. People like to see each other. And intentional mobility can bring together agents, convening meetings or convening in classrooms or what have you that can allow for spread. And it can lead to, you know, distinct patterns in the environment, such as you, you see with these, um, these patterns here, emerging from interaction, excuse me, of infection over time in agents and their choices about their their um, their decisions about, for example, going to to drink or going and feeding in certain areas in the environment. And we saw that to some degree in the wandering elephants, or you did, and we saw also um, last time, you know, this phenomenon of movement from one city to another, which can bring infection. To to spread to 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 new uh, to new environments. Okay, um, uh, I think you know we're uh, we're at time right now, and uh, I think I will um, I think I will stop here. I have included for anyone interested in pursuing this in any logic, you'll find probably a couple dozen videos of me talking about um, capturing mobility. Probably that's an underestimate in any logic, but I've also included some kind of references to this in, in discrete space. Um, I've also in, in incorporated some references with respect to uh, continuous space and interactions with, with time. It turns out discrete space, the sort of uh, situation we see if we have 
uh, cells um, arranged in a grid, for example. Um, if you have movement in the grid, you can have conflicts. You can have two agents that want to move to the same cell at once, for example. And often that goes along with having, often when we have a model like that, we will update it in lockstep. So discrete time updates of models are often used together with discrete space for cellular automata, for example. We have discrete space together with discrete time or the shelling segregation model, kind of discrete space in terms of people movement, people's movement, and we want to be cautious about not having two people to move to the same space. Okay, I think I will stop here. This was on spatial effects, spatial mobility, and it bears noting that just like with networks, it's not a matter of how does it affect uh, how does it influence the speed of transmission? It's about representing interventions that are spatially mediated, and it's about capturing key effects, key reference modes that are spatial, for example, capturing key impacts um, on outcomes you care about, such as walking from investment in walking infrastructure, walkability in, a, in neighborhoods. Um, it's about looking at differential um, access to resources or differential outcomes in different areas. Um, so uh, that's a little bit on space, another aspect of context, okay? Um, thank you for bearing with the, uh, uh, the, the problems with uh, loading wandering elephants. Hopefully you'll get a bit of a chance to explore it uh, yourself. And I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday. I'm sorry, Thursday. Thanks very much. And I'll hold office hours.